Worth Fighting For is made possible by AARP. In these United States of America, in our great state of Arkansas, our tomorrows have always been better than our yesterdays. We have so much to be thankful for and to live for. As soldiers, airmen, Marines, sailors, Coast Guardsmen, National Guardmen, and our reservists, our job is to get the mission done. It's a tough job completed by smart, tough men and women. Once the mission is over and our time and service comes to an end, we take those experiences with us for the rest of our lives. The good and the bad, the ups and the downs, they stay with us. And that's why it's so important that whenever one of our veterans find themselves in a position where they need help, we are there for them. Tonight, we're talking to veterans, to their families and their friends, to everyone who has a veteran in their life, to ensure that no one is left behind because our veterans and their mental health is worth fighting for. That heartfelt introduction from Colonel Nate Todd, Secretary of Arkansas Department of Veterans Affairs. Hi, everybody. I'm Donna Terrell. And tonight, I'll be leading a discussion on preventing deaths by suicide in the veteran community. Our guests are Gina Chandler, Assistant Director for Veterans Services and Arkansas Department of Veterans Affairs, Laura Watlington, Suicide Prevention Program Manager at Central Arkansas Veterans Healthcare Systems, retired Colonel Don Berry of the Arkansas Veterans Coalition, Dr. Mandy McCorkendale, Chief Psychologist at Central Arkansas Veterans Healthcare Systems, and retired Marine Corps Staff Sergeant Dan Hall. I want to thank you all for being here. Really appreciate it. You know, one of the things I've been wondering is let's talk about statistics here and how deaths among veterans compare to deaths among civilians. So we usually are about two years behind on st statistics to make sure that they're accurate. In 2019, there were approximately 47,000 people who died by suicide in the United States. Mm -hmm. Veterans make up eight to nine percent of the population but they make up 20% of the deaths by suicide. So that's a significant number. That is significant, 20%, but they only make up eight to 9% of the population. Yes. So why is this happening? Why are so many veterans committing suicide? Veterans are a special population. They have been through experiences that the rest of us have not been through. They, um, firearms is the number one way that people die by suicide and veterans are very well versed in firearms and so they tend to have more in their homes and they're again comfortable with the weapon and so with firearms being the number one way that people die by suicide, veterans are well, they do well with the firearms. Okay. So they're not afraid to commit suicide. So when times get tough and they feel like they need to end it all, they're not afraid to do it. It's a means by which that they can feel like they're in control as well, too. And that recognizing that they're in an out of control situation and having the thought of uh, suicidology, uh, the, the idea that you would do this, it actually puts them back in control because they are now taking control of their, of their dilemma that they have that they're dealing with. Okay, and I, and I fully understand that. I guess what I'm trying to get to is, is there, and certainly people want to take their lives for a number of reasons, we know this, but is there an underlying issue that veterans are facing that the rest of the population does not? Readjustment. Readjustment back into society, um, readjustment coming from a controlled environment from the military, and they're, we're told when to eat, you know, what to eat, when to go to bed, when to get up. We're, our day is so structured that coming back to the civilian world, there's no structure there, there's no um, continuity of what they were used to in the military. How often do families put pressure on them? Because when you say, you know, they're in this structured environment and then they come back home where there is no structure. There's an issue of control 
Um, I've been called a control freak. I like to call myself a control enthusiast. <laughs> uh, and a lot of cases, when they come back home, they're not in control. The household's been run by somebody else, and they're kind of a visitor for the first few months. In addition to that, they're pretty proud people. Uh, used to being expected to take care of themselves, and they don't readily ask for help. Mm -hmm. um, we have about 80% of veterans aren't in what we call the veterans community. They don't join the American Legion, they don't join the disabled American veterans. They compartmentalize that and go on with their lives. And consequently, when they end up with a situation uh, where they feel that nobody really understands, I'm kind of in this alone, and when it's no longer something that they can tolerate, then suicide enters the picture. And I'm glad you mentioned that because generally when people die by suicide, they don't want to end their life. They want to end the pain that they're in, the physical, emotional turmoil that they might be facing. They see no other way to end that pain. And so they think suicide's the only way out rather than seeing an alternative to how they're currently feeling, seeing other ways to get through the crisis. Mm. So I think it's very important to have veterans who have peers. You know, we have a peer support program at the VA but they, they are able to relate to one another in ways that I, as a non-veteran, can never relate to a veteran. And that's really what they need. They, they need the support from their yeah. community when they're in crisis, especially. Bringing them into the community, into the resources, and away from that isolation. Bringing them in. Uh, to their brothers and sisters. I yeah. mean, that's the people that understand them the most, understand the language, understand why something triggers them the way that it does. Um, that's what we mean bringing them into the community if they're fellow brother and sisters in arms. So how do you reach them? You know, I mean, obviously I think the onus falls on the people closest to them. They recognize, one would think, if something is wrong. But how do you reach a veteran who's in crisis before they get to the point that's, where they want to end it all? That's the real trick is to deal with them before they're in crisis. Yeah. And that takes a public health community networking uh, for example, in my community, when we broke this down, you look at the community at large. Well, the community at large is made up of a dozen or more smaller communities within the community. The veterans community, which we think of as the veteran service organizations and VA and so on. The law enforcement community, the education community, the health care community. And when you look at, for example, in my county, we've got 40,000 uh, people roughly. Uh, Census tells us there's about 5,060 veterans live in that community. Then you go around and you count how many are members of the different organizations, you come up with less than 1,000 because most of us belong to two or three of those organizations. Okay, so that's 20%. Where are the other 80% of those veterans? Yeah, well, where are they? Well, we do some surveys and we find out the chief of police is astounded to find that 20% of his workforce are veterans. The sheriff has 33 veterans on, on his department. One of the national initiatives and one that we're adopting here in Arkansas is ask the question. Uh, you will see more and you will hear more about that uh, from other as, as it programs roll out. But simply asking, did you or a, service, uh, a family member serve in the military? And not asking if they're veterans, asking if they served in the military and the family member. Because the families are as essential uh, at risk and part of the solution as are the service members. So it, that's why we deal with service members, veterans, and their families. And asking the question, did you serve or have you served, is going to be a very common theme that you're going to see an awful lot of. Okay. You know, one of the things I want to touch on before we get too far into this discussion is National Guard. National Guard members have a higher rate of suicide than veterans in general. Correct. Uh, hopefully I'm saying that right. Yes. Um, Absolutely. Uh, that, that's correct. So when you think about the challenge of deploying um, to an austere environment uh, for an active duty um, service member who goes with their own unit, goes with their teammates, they deploy together, and then they return together, but for the National Guard, um, oftentimes there's, um, it's, it's disjointed. They're returning to their local communities, maybe to rural areas that don't have good access to mental health. They also don't have direct access to their teammates. Mm -hmm. So 
Um, they may drill one weekend out of a month and that's when they see, maybe they see the people that they deployed with and they have that camaraderie and that they're able to engage in that, kind of have that cohesiveness. But then they go back to their regular lives. And so, um, so that's just an added complication um, to overcoming that sense of isolation that often uh, goes hand in hand with uh, suicidal behavior. It's interesting when you bring that up. What were you going to say? I'm our, sorry. Our outreach program runs into this and for, for years. Uh, I'm commander of the local disabled American veterans chapter and involved with the, all of the organizations. And they've all from time to time said, we need to go outreach to these National Guard. We have a post right the there. Armories. Well, mm -hmm. what you find out when you really dig into it is the reason they're not involved is they don't live there. The people right. that come to our armory for drill once a week, they live in Missouri mm -hmm. and over in uh, Oklahoma and southern Arkansas. They don't live in Mountain Home, Arkansas. Right. So that's why it's very difficult for our organizations to outreach to them. To, to reach them, that's interesting. Let's talk, too, about, you know, we talk about veterans. Um, obviously, they're no longer in service. But the ones who are currently enlisted and they have several tours that they do with little breaks and then maybe a long tour, another break, a long tour. If they're struggling trying to readjust when they get back home and then they're back in it again, there's no one really to help them. So I guess my question is, is are there any services being offered to them that they're actually taking advantage of while they're enlisted as opposed to waiting for them to get home? Well, it wasn't until recently that they could um, receive help while in service. Why couldn't they before? Because if they received help um, to, up until recently, and we're talking probably last five years, um, you would be kicked out of the service if you sought mental health help. Oh. Because if you were diagnosed with a mental health illness, you were not considered worldwide qualified, meaning you couldn't deploy to wherever you needed to deploy to or do your job, and therefore you were no longer needed in service. I don't have to tell you this. You know how horrible that sounds? That sounds yes. very bad. Well, and, and I, I, as a psychologist who practiced um, as an active in active duty in the Air Force, I just want to say, oh wait, that's cringeworthy for me because um, because that's a myth. That's, that's a perception. That's part of, of what contributes to stigma. And so not all mental health diagnoses create discharge from the military. Well, which ones do? Right, so it's complicated. So I mean, so if you're, <laughs> if you're afraid of being diagnosed, okay, mm -hmm. so I'm gonna get diagnosed and mine may fall in this one category versus the other one. Right. I'm not gonna even go. Exactly. Right. Right. So, so what we say is, um, is access treatment early when they're, when it's easier to intervene, okay? So if we let mental health problems, mental health illnesses escalate to the point of something like a, a hospitalization, that can create problems. But we have service members who are currently serving who have been hospitalized for suicidal behavior. So it's, it, Historically, probably so. And the tip of the iceberg that you see is the people who get discharged. But there are a lot of service members who are receiving mental health services and are continuing to serve. So. I'm glad we're clarifying that. <laughs> yes. I'm glad you brought it up because yes. that's... Well, there's there's that's, no more to it than that also it, having to do with concurrent pay. If, and one of the reasons that people in the Guard don't seek help or file benefits with the VA I have one that I'm working with now who's a member of the Coast Guard Reserve. He's very close to retirement, but he has a 10% disability service connected. Okay, once he accepted that, he goes to drill on a weekend. Instead of getting paid, they take his money. That's true. Because he cannot get paid f from the Department of Defense and from VA at the same time. Now, that only applies in the military. And if he went to work for the post office, he can work full time and get a VA pension and a full check. But if, he, if he's trying to serve in the military, then you have this concurrent pay problem. You have to have a, you have to have a disability of more than 50% before you have concurrent uh, 
receipts, but you receipt. can't drill and receive um, benefits at the same time. And that um, a lot of our guards, this affects a lot of the guard because the guard are still drilling. They're still in it. Once you leave active duty, uh, and some leave active duty and go into the guard, you cannot receive VA benefit compensation and drill at the same time. So when they're going for their two weeks out of the year or every other um, weekend, they, they receive money or compensation from that. They can't receive both at the same time. So a lot of times in dealing with veterans and guardsmen, I hear, um, well, I don't want to file for this disability because I'm close to retirement or it's going to affect my status in the guard. And so they may not be getting the help they need if they're still continuing to drill and be in the guard. And I would just like to point out, um, I, I joined the VA approximately 10 years ago. Service connection status and benefits, it was a foreign language to me. And so for viewers, you know, this might sound like a foreign language, but yes, you can become compensated for an aggravated or, or an acquired injury while you're in service. You can be compensated for that up to a percentage, up to 100%. But then, you know, if you're on active duty and you get paid on guard duty, then that does affect your other income. And so mm -hmm. it's just a very complicated system that um, isn't easy to navigate. Which I want to put a plug in. Please. Please contact the Arkansas Department of Veterans Affairs. That is what we are trained to do to help veterans file their benefits, understand the pay system, understand all of that, and also um, point them in the direction of receiving help. Mm -hmm. Just because you receive compensation doesn't mean they're going to come to the other side of the VA, which is the health care side, which is the most important side in receiving the treatment that they need for help. So I guess that just leads me to the question is how well, first of all, let's just kind of identify what civilians can do to help their loved one. And then I want to talk about what the VA can do once, once someone is able to guide this person or help them understand that, you know, there's support out there. That brings me to two different topics. Um, for one thing, I think a lot of people think that you have to be a trained professional to intervene with somebody who might be suicidal. They think, well, I don't have the training for that. What can I do? That's completely untrue. You know, um, as Colonel Berry pointed out, about six of the 20 veterans who die by suicide per day are not enrolled in VA health care. Do I have that backwards? That's backwards. That's backwards. Okay. Yeah, 14 of this. 14 21. are not enrolled in VA health care. Give that number again. I'm sorry. Okay. Out of, we, we average now about 20 veterans who die by suicide per day. Again, um, we don't really like to call it by number per day, but of those, only six are enrolled in VA health care. And so the others are getting re um, care in the community. And so we want to arm our community providers, but or also- not getting care at all. Or not That's getting care at all. That's probably the biggest point, right. right? So we need our um, family members, friends, acquaintances. We need them to be able to recognize signs, signs of suicidal th thinking, which can vary from person to person significantly. But you know, if you've got somebody who's seeming very hopeless, um, somebody's engaging in risky behaviors, you know, a lot of mood changes, different things, different things that we all experience at times. But if you see them kind of adding up, then you might be prompted to, as Don was saying earlier, ask the question about, um, have you served? But in, in my world for suicide prevention, it's about, are you thinking about suicide? That's one of our big things. And people don't feel comfortable with that. It's a, it's a scary conversation. People think if I ask them that, what am I gonna do? What if they say yes? So are you saying that family members, friends, loved ones Absolutely. should ask, Yes. are Absolutely. you thinking about suicide? Yeah. Should Absolutely. just put that out there. Yes. 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 Absolutely. But I always encourage people when I'm, when I'm talking about this, know what you're going to do if they say yes. Don't be ill-prepared because if they say yes, that can be terrifying. Okay, so what, what do are I do? you supposed to do? You can call 911. You can call the Veterans Crisis Line. Um, we, we will be putting that information up. You can take them to your doctor. Um, you know, you can go to your primary care doctor. You can come as a walk-in at the VA. I think, I think one of the fears, because I, you know, I'm thinking of myself if I were to do that to someone, and then, you know, we go to the doctor, we get help or whatever, and then now that person is mad at me. We, we, what we did in our community, uh, asking the questions, we took on what, what they call QPR, which is question persuade and refer. The question is, are you considering suicide? The persuasion is, you know, that's pretty much a permanent solution to a temporary problem. There are resources. And then have resources to refer them to. Uh, when I started this about six years ago, I think we only had about two QPR instructors in the state. I have 10 in my community now. We have two in the police department, two in the sheriff's department, two in the uh, DAV, 
We have two of them that are home health improvement uh, nurses, and that's the way we've a, a, approached it. But once you've asked the question, and I got into this back door. Uh, I, I was at a gun show one Saturday, and somebody I knew called me and he said, uh, Commander, I got a problem, I need to talk to you. And then he heard the background noise. He said he started to apologize for interfering with my day. And I said, well, give me an hour to get out of here and uh, give me a call. He didn't, and I forgot about it. About four hours later, I wondered, what did he want? And when I tried to reach him, he had ate a bottle of pills. And you beat yourself up for a long time, like, had I been able to take that call, could I have done something? Well, that led me, when I talked about it, the awareness situation, many people who knew him said, well, I'm not really surprised. He's talked about that. I said, well, what did you do? Well, what do you do? And that's when we decided we needed the training programs in the schools, in the community, in the police department, to where people do know that there are resources and how to ask that question. Do we have those training programs now? We do, and QPR, I, I kind of liken to the old concept of CPR. You know, years ago, we lost tens of thousands of people to heart failure until we taught lay people to do CPR. Mm -hmm. uh, QPR is kind of similar. It, it doesn't take a psychologist or a, a psychiatrist to discuss a problem with a person. And the closer that you are to them and their community, the more likely they are to confide in you as opposed to calling some 800 number when they don't know who or what's going to answer. Mm -hmm. So when do we get to the point where we have QPR offered to everyone, was, myself included? I'm glad wow. that you mentioned that because VA has a very similar program to QPR. We do save, but they're, the steps line up precisely. I would just hope that anybody who wants this training can contact the station, contact the VA, contact Mr. Hall, um, I mean, we could just, we are available to offer it. We can do it in small groups, large groups, businesses, schools. What does the training include and how, how quickly can you get through it? I'll tell you what, I have been through eight hour trainings in uh, these resilience programs and, and dealing with suicide. I've been with uh, the first one of the QPR sessions was about two hours. Mm -hmm. And I got more out of the two hour one than I did the whole eight hour day. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, it was very very concise, very easy for anybody to, to follow. Um, and we have lots of good instructors now in this state. Mm -hmm. I, I know we have in our community. I know the health department offers it uh, out mm -hmm. of Little Rock. Uh, used to be Mandy Thomas, I think she's I moved believe up and Jake on. And Jacob Sp Smith, Jacob. Mm -hmm. and now okay. there's a new person coming. And this, okay. is, this is to all our Kansans. I mean, you know, we're a subset of the population, right. but everybody needs to learn this um, okay. to save their son or daughter's life that's being bullied in school or, you know, an elderly um, person that doesn't want to live with their It's it like CPR, like, exactly. like you said. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hold that thought. Now we want to have a message from AARP Arkansas Volunteer President Colonel Charlie Wagner. I am Charlie Wagner, the AARP Arkansas Volunteer State President and a proud Army veteran. As a nonprofit and nonpartisan membership organization, with over 270,000 members in Arkansas, we work to empower people 50 plus to choose how they live with respect and dignity as they age. That includes helping veterans and their families. We also want to help veterans and military families better navigate other resources so they get the most from their earned and deserved service benefits. Two of the many AARP resources you'll find include a military caregiving guide for veterans, service members and their families, as well as a recently created AARP Veterans Health Benefits Navigator, which is a one-stop resource on health care information from the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs, military TRICARE, Medicare, private insurance, and even Medicaid. These two informational resources and many more can be found at aarp.org veterans. Check it out for yourself. I might add that all of these resources are free and you do not need to be an AARP member to access them. Thank you for your tireless and relentless service to our great nation. And that, of course, was Colonel Wagner. We appreciate that. I do want to talk about resources with this panel, but before we get into that, and I had a quick thought, 
we need to talk about COVID and the effect that COVID had or is having on suicides among veterans, military professionals. Per national um, reports out of you know the Office of Mental Health and Suicide Prevention, it did not have an impact on veteran suicide. It did not. It did not have an impact, but I, I just, I'm not quite sure. I, I don't necessarily agree with that. Um, I could speak kind of locally in the state of Arkansas, FY20 or you know 2021, since we've been dealing with the pandemic, we have seen an increase in suicide rates among veterans and among civilians. And it's um, taken a toll on everybody because the things that people could access before for resources, even just you know visiting with friends and whatnot, all of those resources disappeared with COVID. And so the support systems were gone. And so I believe that it did have a significant impact. And, and, and I would add to that that when we're talking about suicide, suicide as the tip of the iceberg, that is what we see, that's what we're counting. But underneath that is mental health crisis, is mm -hmm. distress, is uh, problems, and that, that we need to help get people connected to resources before it becomes a statistic that we're counting, right? So, so it, it's, you know, it's also about reaching people who are feeling isolated, who are um, experiencing the difficulties and before it gets to that point. Yes. And during COVID, there were a lot of people isolated. Yes. We, we yeah. anticipated that with our program since we are in the outreach business and, and contacting people, buddy checks all the time. We anticipated that increased isolation would be a problem. We were able, fortunately, besides the small uh, grant that we got from Disabled American Veterans National uh, Service Foundation, we got some money from the CARES Act and really accelerated that outreach over the winter time through, through Christmas and, and whatnot of last year. And we actually had a downturn. Uh, when we started our program, Baxter County was the highest suicide rate in the state. We had two a month, 24 in one year. The high year was 2016. As we began our program, we cut that rate by a third. And that's when we started to apply for the grants to, to help us a little bit. So, well, you know, one year does not a trend set, but we might be onto something. Mm -hmm. That trend continued. This year, as of the third quarter, we've had a total of three suicides in our county. Now, I don't wait two years for VA's 2019 statistics. Right. Part of our organization, our partnership is the county coroner. So I can get actual numbers, not statistics, mm -hmm. every month. Mm -hmm. And we're at the point now for this entire year, we've had three suicides, two veterans and one non. Mm -hmm. Certainly three or too many, but that's, that's compared to 20, 24, that's yeah, pretty that's, incredible. That one is pretty incredible. So you're doing something right. That's mm -hmm. good. Um, one thing I've failed to mention is that suicide is related to loss. And so if you think about loss of a loved one, whether it's um, death or, you know, a divorce, loss of a child, um, whether that's just angst and, um, you know, separation of ways, that kind of loss, loss of a job, loss of income, loss of independence, mm -hmm. as you get older, loss of physical ability, all of these things are real triggers for suicide. And so I think that anytime you see somebody facing one or more losses, particularly if they're, they're big, you know, somebody getting older, unable to care for themselves, that's a really difficult thing for one to s accept and face and ask for that kind of help. Mm -hmm. And so I just really want people to think about loss as the major risk factor for suicide. And also to be aware of that it's normal as a human to feel a great deal of emotional pain when you are faced with, with loss like that, especially compounding loss. And so, you know, recognizing as humans, we are designed to avoid pain, right? I mean, if we go to touch, a, if we put our hand out on a hot stove, what's gonna happen? We, we don't even think about it. We're, we're avoiding it, we're pulling away from it. So with loss, like Laura has described, it is, there's a degree of normalcy to think about not wanting to live anymore, to not wanting to live like this. Um, and, and then the way that people think about that is what also then contributes to them feeling odd or different or what's wrong with me. They question themselves, they question meaning, you know, what that says about them. And 
when when there is no one intervening, um, when, people can get really lost in their own thoughts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, this is, you, I have to commend you all because this is a great conversation. I think we're making some really good headway. Um, Colonel Wagner would be upset if we don't talk about resources. Definitely. So yes. let's, <laughs> let's get that in. What's available, first of all, to veterans? I'm going to ask about families as well, mm -hmm. but what's available? We have um, the Vet Center. The VA mm -hmm. has the Vet Center uh, for counseling and readjustment. Um, obviously, the VA, health mental, the VA mental health program in the Central Arkansas healthcare system, or whatever VA system you use, because five um, five medical centers touch Arkansas, so it could be Memphis, Poplar Bluff, Fayetteville, Shreveport, um, or Central Arkansas healthcare system. Um, Arkansas Department of Veterans Affairs, it's it's reaching out to somebody so we can um, pull the resources around them because it may be mental health, but it also may be a, a financial situation. It may be other tied into it. It's not just, here, we're going to ship you off for mental health, and mm -hmm. that's it. It's going to solve everything. Because it, it, they're going through something, mm -hmm. so they need help with whatever it is, the catalyst yes. that's creating this emotion. One of the navigators now that we have that's emerging since last fall, locally developed in northwest Arkansas, is a resource called Camp Connect. Uh, mm -hmm. Those who visit uh, the DMV, the revenue offices in Northwest Arkansas, or even Hearts is now over in Jonesboro, they have rolled out 65 kiosks to this point in time that you'll see in these public places that basically that ask the question, and then through an iPad that's located there, you can actually navigate to resources that deal with education or housing or Child employment, care. but also connecting with the VA. So. That resource list is expanding. Uh, we're seeing really significant uh, interest, not only here in Arkansas, but as Gina had indicated to us, that Oklahoma is very much interested in adopting the program as well, too. Absolutely. So it's a kiosk space that you'll see in public places. So there's no stigma attached to going to it and taking a look at what's there. And you can also shoot the QR code on your phone. Mm -hmm. So you can take it away from you and then you have on your phone, you have all those resources designed here in Arkansas and CARES Act funding supported its deployment. Don, you brought up something that's important to talk about too, stigma. When you talk about mental health, there are many communities, African-American community is one of them where, you know, a lot of people are opposed to getting mental health mm -hmm. help. How do you convince someone even once you've identified that they're suicidal, how do you convince them that mm -hmm. it's okay, right. you can do this? I wish we had more time. <laughs> 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 One of the things VA has done is we've um, created a program, which you could talk more about, but it's called Primary Care Behavioral Health. And so one can go to their primary care doctor and then they can see mental health while they're in just the primary care appointment. So that, you know, allows them to be seen without having to go to a mental health clinic or, to, you know, without the stigma, I would think, because stigma is a huge factor. Um, did you want to? Yeah, so it just increases the availability and access. Um, so whether it's within the VA system or even non-VA, going and seeing your primary care doctor, that's the first, that can be the first step. Let, let me just, and I'd, I'd rather someone see a primary care doctor than no one at all, but is that primary care doctor really able to help them in the way that you would be able to? Oftentimes, they can help get people connected to mental health services. So they may have someone that they refer to, they can assist, you know, ideally they would have someone right there in their office that they could hand uh, the patient off to, uh, to see, but yeah. I will say this, uh, many people will listen to their primary mm -hmm. care docs. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, I, and I'm not trying to dismiss and, that, I'm just bringing well, it up as fact. Well, our data shows, you know, generally people who die by suicide, they have seen their primary care doctor within 30 days of their death. Not mental health, but they've seen primary care. That's what we've seen over the past six years that I've studied veteran suicide. And so VA has armed our primary care doctors and their staff to assess for suicide in a deeper way than they did previously. And as Mandy said, if they get that assessment and evaluation, then they can be um, referred to a kind of a higher level or more specialized care. Also for the veterans, in Arkansas, we have 12 
community-based outpatient clinics uh, from Mountain Home all the way to El Dorado and across the state, Mina, uh, Helena, West Helena. There are 12 of these community-based outpatient clinics operated by the VA and it becomes, as Laura would indicate, you do the, you go there for your primary care, but a part of that primary care service is just like dermatology is primary care, mm -hmm. is behavioral health. Not we would like to call that behavioral health because it's part of the overall spirit. Mm -hmm. And so that one building encompasses all of those specialties. So Mind, there isn't the stigma. Yeah. So there isn't the stigma attached with parking in front of some building that has a it's a, it, a, a <coughs> mental, mental health, health facility. Right. Yeah. I do want to say one thing. In the last um, two three years now, um, mental health help with the VA has been opened up to veterans with other than honorable discharges. That's key. Glad you brought that up, and that was something I wanted to discuss we because are. before, if you if you get a dishonorable discharge, then you're cut off. Correct. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, even knowing that you were discharged dishonorably, Could you need a, help. You need help. In addition to everything else you're dealing Absolutely. with. Absolutely. Bringing it full circle to resources and what have. When we started our program locally in our more rural, isolated area, uh, when I first wrote this proposal, which became our grant. Uh, my logic was, well, you know, they can turn Dan Hall down pretty easy, but maybe they'd think twice about Senator Bozeman. Mm -hmm. So I got Senator John Bozeman to give us a letter of support. Lieutenant Governor Tim Griffin, uh, Congressman Crawford, and we had all these letters of support that said, and Senator Bozeman took that and he, in D.C., he kind of nationalized our program and said, look at what Mountain Home, Arkansas is doing with very little funding. Mm -hmm. And he introduced uh, Senate Bill 1906 and then uh, 785, which became the Colonel John Hammond uh, Veterans Mental Health Improvement Act, which requires the VA then to provide resources in the community to programs like ours, bottom up instead of top down. Mm -hmm. We're currently involved with a Together with Veterans grant from the VA that helps with some of our expenses. So the whole thing has come full cycle. Uh, we now have a full mental health uh, service at the community-based outreach clinic. At the same time, Baxter Regional Medical Center, because of the Mission Act, has really come on board to, to be the primary uh, provider for veterans in our community. And they now have a full behavioral health and substance abuse team. So it, it, it gets also well, back to the question of stigma. When one person goes to this facility that says mental health, you've got a stigma. But when the whole community is involved with this and they understand the gravity of the thing and how it is that we can deal with it as a community, a lot of that stigma goes away. Absolutely. We talk a little bit about an off uh, focus on the individual treatment programs such as these, but a larger measure in the direction that we're approaching nationally is a public health approach mm -hmm. that treats communities. When you consider, and I've shared this with Colonel Todd, if I had uh, out of 100, uh, if we could spend 50 cents of every dollar in our communities for community wellness so that we can ensure that our communities are resilient and strong and that we do have relationships with our neighbors, that's worth the half investment. And then 30% perhaps is being spent on the treatment programs we've talked about, the clinical treatment programs, and then still save uh, twenty percent or so fifteen percent towards crisis intervention mm -hmm. but when we focus all of our efforts on crisis intervention you'll never be able to save everybody right. and if you try to treat everybody uh, that is at risk you'll always be in that catch-up so what we have to do is recognize a three-prong approach and find ways to treat our communities Colonel Todd and I've talked about this a number of occasions that the health of a community may be best identified by the attendance at Friday night football games. Mm. And when you think about the fact that if attendance is high, that community is strong, they, they're there to be there together with their friends and their neighbors, that's a very resilient community. So one of the metrics that we'd like to watch would be, what's our attendance at Friday night football games? Mm -hmm. And a well-attended communities where, or Little League, or parades, or those events where we can, as a community, relate to one another when we see good turnout and good performance, 
and involvement of our community members together, that is a defense measure that prevents those somewhat uh, loss of hopefulness and mm -hmm. alone uh, incidences occurring that drive people over down, down the path. I'm going to ask a, a question. This, I don't think this will sound odd, but um, I have been in places where, um, you know, a, a veteran may be there and people feel like he's odd mm -hmm. or afraid to talk to him because he's odd. I, I hope you follow what I'm saying here. How do communities... Because when you talk about bringing people together at a football game and you have someone who is just kind of different than everyone else, and I'm specifically talking about a veteran, how does the community embrace, how does the community help that person? Because you don't know what's going on with yeah. them. You have to socialize them. You have to recognize that because you may see that they're, they're off or some like, well, chances are they're companions, they're, they're associates, they're colleagues, they're, they're people who they are around normally all the time. They will note that change. So there's a, that's, a, that's a reason for a, an alert. Uh, but the best way to, to, to recognize is that if someone's off, let's discover what's, what's off, what's driven them, because you've recognized you know, Aunt Mary isn't There's the way. There's something not quite right. There's something right. not quite right. Yeah. I would start by having a conversation with them. Okay. I yeah. mean, you don't want to isolate them more by, you know, looking away or being afraid of the behavior is, you know, talking to them and, and finding out what is wrong with them or, you know, um, my dad used to always drink and I didn't understand why. He was self-medicating and I just thought, okay, well, dad comes home from work, he drinks. He was numbing the pain. So it may be that person that's off, it may be that person that's numbing the pain, um, but talk to them and see, not, and I, one thing I wanna make sure we make clear, not every veteran is a combat veteran. We're not focusing mm -hmm. just on combat veterans. Mm -hmm. You know, it, my service in the military, two and a half years, changed me forever. So going through basic training, they tear you down to build you up and or into the soldier or airman you are that changes your trajectory your life forever the way you handle stress the way you handle um, conflict so you know basically it's every veteran every, that's why we ask the question did you serve ask them how they're doing did you serve and how are you doing? And, and the, the person, you know, this, this person that I'm describing, mm -hmm. it sounds to me what you're saying is get to know that person. Reach well, out. Get to know reach them, out. reach out because mm -hmm. they may be just fine, right? but they may not be. And the only way you're going to be able to discern is to have that conversation. And I think even before them. you get to that point, inclusiveness, accept them as they are. They might seem a little different, but oh, hey, come on out to the football game. Everybody will be there or some sort of community food, food event or something like that. Be inclusive and try to get them to at least attend, if not talk at that point, because they may not be ready to share what's going on with them, but to just have them feel a part of something could be a significant impact in their life. Yeah. And family members are going to notice the change before the service member. Mm -hmm. uh, or the veteran, um, you know, veterans think they're fine. You know, oh, it's just a drink or two. Mm -hmm. They don't realize they're going down this rabbit hole. <coughs> so, and I'll give you a perfect example. A veteran, a father yesterday said, you need to call my son. My son needs help. You need to call my son. Mm -hmm. And I called him and he says, you know, I haven't been getting treatment at the VA. I haven't done anything since 2012. Um, I mm -hmm. went through a substance abuse program, but I need help. And I said, okay, we're going to get you help. So it was the father member, father realized or recognizing the son needed help. Um, you know, and I said, are you in crisis right now? Because if you're in crisis, we need to take care of you right now. He said, I'm not in crisis right now. And I gave him the steps for if he is in crisis, what he needs to do. So it's family members recognizing it before service uh, veterans. And um, let, let me just mm -hmm. throw this out here. Um, because we do talk about family members, and I think you mentioned something a little earlier about someone who committed suicide, and family recognized that 
this person was suicidal. Mm -hmm. uh, so now I want to talk about how do survivors deal with guilt when they've missed something? I think that you can never blame yourself for somebody dying by suicide. And um, I don't know if you've noticed, but in, in the world of preventing suicide or trying to prevent, we don't, we don't ever say commit suicide. I'm sorry. Oh no, oh no, it's a very common thing. Most people say that, but there's a negative connotation with that. Um, we tend to say die by suicide. Some people even say suicided, which I haven't gotten on board with that. Some might say they died from depression. Um, again, you know, the word suicide itself has a lot of stigma to it. But, you know, as, as professionals, you know, I mean, we are bound by ethical duty to do right by our patients, and a patient can walk out of your office and immediately go die by suicide. And, you know, the guilt that that could put on you, the same with any family member, is that you, you can only work with what you have, and people have the right to not tell everything, to, to not admit to having suicidal thoughts, to not admit feeling so poorly that they would like to end their life. And so while family members can beat themselves up as well as professionals, we are not miracle workers we can lift the community and try to prevent somebody from getting to the point where they would rather end it all than try to find a way out of it. But we, we I, would, I should just hope nobody ever feels that much guilt because it's, it's not bearable. There's nothing you can do to stop somebody. If somebody is going to do it and commit the act, they're going to do it. Even if you get them help? I mean, we're talking about getting them help. Yeah. Yes, even if you get them help. They can leave the next day and go, and follow through with their plan. In the end, they're responsible for their own decision. All you do is have your input and help. But uh, tying in with some of what Don said and what Laura was saying, I look at the thing, the, the three things having to do with suicide, community, faith, and resilience. You get your resilience by being part of the community, joining your veteran service organizations, have people that you can deal with and talk to, and have the whole community involved in this. I guess I'm a little proud of my community. It's a little unique, but I was elected county judge in Baxter County. I'm a, a Marine. Chief of Police was a retired Marine. Many of my appointments to different commissions and so on were people who I knew had vast military experience. We have a retirement community. People like Don who were colonels and lieutenant colonels in the military and have a variety of different talents that can go to work in your community. And that whole thing creates the resilience and veterans feel that they're part of it. Uh, and I've dealt with this before. It's, it's not unique to veterans. I mentioned uh, in a previous discussion that one of the highest uh, suicide rates as far as professions is law enforcement for very similar reasons. Mm -hmm. Law enforcement officers go to work every day. It isn't what I do, it's who I am. I am a police officer. I am a public safety officer. And all the decisions I make every day impact a whole lot of people in the community. I worked shift work all these years. I've been through two or three wives. The kids are off at college, and now it's retirement age. And they retire and they go home, and suddenly every decision they make only affects themselves. And they begin to feel completely irrelevant mm -hmm. and alone. That's when it's very similar to retired military. Mm -hmm. I know people came back from Vietnam. There was no such thing as post-traumatic stress or Americans with Disabilities Act. You went on with your life. And what did they do? Well, you, first of all, you weren't going to seek mental health because you want to succeed in the civilian community, which means you're going to be a policeman, a fireman, a school teacher, or whatever. Mental health, you're not coming into this. Age. And so then they get to retirement age and all these things they compartmentalized all these years when they're sitting at home on the recliner come back and bite them. And that's when we need to be there for them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One of our new and ongoing efforts is called the Governor's Challenge. And I wanted to see if I could bring it back. Uh, Laura, Gina, Dan and I are amongst uh, probably 30 or more who are part of the Arkansas team. Uh, the Arkansas team is one of eight teams uh, in our current cohort. Uh, the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Agency is of uh, DHHS, in partnership with the VA, a number of years ago established Mayor's Challenges and Governor's Challenges, where you put a cross-government team together, including the private sector and, and veteran organizations and military de uh, Department of Defense as well, 
in establishing programs within your state. Sometimes uh, policy adjustments, uh, maybe engagement of different initiatives. And we have a team here in Arkansas, we've been working for about six months, divided up into three segments, uh, policy uh, areas. Uh, uh, identification of SMVF service member veteran and their families and screen for suicide risk, connectedness and care transitions, lethal means safety, and, and safety planning. And in fact, that segment, Laura runs, is the, is the team leader for lethal means safety and safety planning, which is very significant. And in fact, this week, the White House uh, released its plan for addressing suicide within the veteran and military community and their emphasis is on lethal means safety. So that's very much key. We talked about it earlier about the incidence of firearms use and in this case here the main theme of the White House's effort going forward is addressing the lethal means safety. That's a critical component. We talk about firearms being the number one method for dying by suicide. If you can get a little bit of space between the firearm and the person who might die, die with it, whether it's a gun lock, um, they can keep their gun and their ammo separate. Um, we have people that sometimes give their guns to family members or friends, even to law enforcement at times. Law enforcement will hold on to the gun. There's a big misconception that people have that if I say I'm suicidal, they're going to take my firearm. That is absolutely false. That Second Amendment right stands very firmly. There are very, very, very few incidents where you might have to give up your gun rights, but that's such a common myth. We also have people say, why would I want to have, what good is my gun going to do if it's unlocked? You know, what if I have an intruder? And you can say, you know, how often has, has your home been broken into that you've actually needed to use a, an armed weapon to defend your home? Probably not very many times. And so when you're having suicidal thoughts, it would be safer for you and your family to possibly have that separated or locked in some way. We also like to frame it as a child safety issue. We've all seen news stories where children have died with, you know, open, accessible firearms and so it's just very important to keep them safe because if I wanted to shoot myself and I don't have a gun then I can't. Right. I simply cannot do it. And it gives you time to think about it, it gives you time for someone to come and help you, yes. it just gives you time. time. You need time. Mm -hmm. You know that makes me think of the, the slide. <laughs> uh, I, I've actually submitted this but there's there's a slide we have at VA, and I hate to get the paper out, but the time from decision of saying, I am going to die by suicide, I am going to kill myself, to actually taking uh, action is less than an hour. So statistically, if someone di decides to die by suicide, when they actually take action, it's less than one hour. So it's gonna happen within an hour? Generally, yes. Gen okay, Generally. Mm -hmm. So if you can give them a moment, well, I gotta go get the key to my gun lock. Okay, wait, I need to go call someone. I need to go call the crisis line. And I know it's not ideal to have an 800 number, but I would like to make sure that we do discuss the veteran crisis line oh, as, a, as a resource. Oh, I wasn't going to this conversation <laughs> without saying, okay, so let, who do let we me call? Not, let me not jump ahead. But it's very critical. Um, sometimes it's even less than five minutes that somebody decides to take their life and then takes the action. And so it's just very critical to put space between whatever method, and we talk a lot about firearms, that if somebody's going to overdose, you know, you can use pill counters. You can ask your family, hey, I just need seven days worth of medication at a time. A lot of pharmacies will put them into blister packs and that way you know it takes a lot more effort than just to open a bottle. Mm -hmm. Knives, I mean there's so many different ways um, of lethal means safety but we do focus on firearms. Okay. Um, I, I just want to just briefly, we have about three minutes left, I want to just talk about addiction, mm -hmm. talk about alcoholism. Some of these things come into play with alcoholism. Is it okay? Do you suggest a veteran go to AA meetings? or should they really reach out to, to the veterans, to the VA? I believe AA has been a long-standing program that's been very successful for many people. I don't think it's the, the program for everyone, and so I think absolutely, if AA suits your needs, there are AA meetings online, you can look them up for your community all over the place. But there's other ways to reach out for help with addiction. VA has some very good programs, whether it's inpatient, outpatient, we've got a, like a 28-day stay program we have intensive outpatient programs and we've actually been able to, as a result of the pandemic, um, 
uh, expand that to yeah. offer a virtual um, mm -hmm. intensive outpatient program. So it doesn't matter what part of the state you're in, you can, if, as long as you have a device that connects to the internet, you can you connect can through connect. Uh, to, internet. to their intensive outpatient program. And, you know, there, there are a lot of really helpful interventions, including medications mm -hmm. that can help with um, controlling substance okay. um, substance disorders. Let's get final thoughts because we're at the end of the road here. Um, what do you want to leave our viewers with? What is it? We've given them a lot of information, but in addition to all of that, what are your final thoughts? I would have to say that if you are truly feeling hopeless, to know that there is some hope out there. And if you can't hope for yourself, I can hope for you, or somebody else can hope for you, and do it until you get there yourself. But if you take that final step, you're gonna miss any chance ever. And so just reach out. It might take more than one time of reaching out, but reach out. Okay. Yeah, um, I, I definitely agree with what you're saying there. And the family needs to be aware. I, I always preach to the family because the family knows the, their family member better than anybody else. So family, please pick up on these resources and have them. You may not need them now. You may need them five years from now. Mm -hmm. You may need them tomorrow. But the family members need to, you know, make sure their, their family member's okay, okay and ask the questions and don't be afraid and know what to do. If you're one of those people that's sitting at home feeling useless and, and uninvolved and what have you, look to your community to where you can be, develop a purpose-driven life. There are so many things you can you get involved with uh, veteran service organizations as opposed to asking for help, offer the help that you have. Uh, our hospitals, our, our county sheriffs, all of them use volunteer labor all the time for specific purposes. Our Baxter Regional Medical Center I don't think could operate without the cadre of volunteers that are every day they're there. Uh, and that's how I stay involved. I told somebody one time, if you hear Dan Hall committed suicide, call the FBI. There's something wrong. There. <laughs> wrong Dan Hall. Something's but wrong there. That's because I live a purpose-driven life. I have mm -hmm. reason to go get up every day and go do something, so help somebody else. Okay. And, and that's a huge value. Mm -hmm. So okay. don't sit out there feeling like you're worthless. Uh, okay. All the talents you got, you can bring to bear in your community. I'm gonna one more thought. I'm gonna have to wrap this up. Will Beams to from the Veterans uh, Coalition. Veterans are not a special needs community, we're a special skills community. So enroll us in those efforts in the community uh, and make sure, don't be afraid to ask the question, how are you? Okay. Mm -hmm. You're not what's, alone. What's that 800 The 800 number, number Veterans Crisis Line, 1-800-273-TALK or 1-800-273-8255. This is the same number as the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. Anybody can call it. It will say if you're a veteran, press one. We know that they don't always press one and that's fine. They're still getting help. They're about to implement 988. That will get you to the same call centers. 988 and program that in your phone yes. and I also see a text number there on the screen so yeah. we got uh -huh. it covered okay All right. well, thank you so much this thank has you. been such an important conversation you. you guys were great thank you so thank, much. thank you and unfortunately we're out of time yet this is a crucial conversation and it should continue encourage I encourage you to take a look at the resources that we've talked about this evening because your well-being is worth fighting for Again, thank you for joining us. I'm Donna Terrell. Good night. Worth Fighting For is made possible by AARP.